How are you guys? It's good to see you. Uh, if I hadn't met you, my name is Justin. I'm one of the pastors here at Buncombe Street. And the first thing that I want to say is, you please give it up for our musicians who helped lead us in worship tonight. I want to I wanna first especially welcome you if you're here for the first time or if you're back from college. I want to say welcome home. I know we've got a lot of college kids here. Or if you're just visiting with a friend, um, we are so glad to have you. Man, God is doing big things in this place. Uh, and if you just watch, the Holy Spirit is at work. And we are so proud uh, to be a part of Buncombe Street. And I hope you are too. So thank you for being here tonight. I do want to say, I will say right off, I have no idea which direction to face. Um, <laughs> In fact, I was practicing last night. I was like, I just thought I would just like turn around and maybe. So don't let that be a distraction um, to you tonight uh, as we move forward. Also, I want to tell you one other thing that could be a little bit awkward tonight. Um, If you will go ahead and reach down in your bag underneath your seat. Everybody will find a bag. I want you to go ahead, if you would, and pull out communion. Um, This is Jesus in a shot glass and a cracker. Um, (laughs) I know that it's not normally what we do. Uh, We like to celebrate by intention, and you hear all that noise. This is the reason that I wanted to go ahead and get you to do this. So if you'll just pull out your prepackaged communion, and I just want you to set it somewhere where you can get to it, where it's not awkward when we're in the moment of communion. So everybody do that and set it to the side, and we'll have it. And there is a little wafer there. If you look underneath that piece of plastic, And we're going to break the piece of plastic off at the end of this sermon. You'll pull it back and take your wafer, and then you'll break another piece of plastic off, and we're going to drink communion. Now, some of you may criticize this, but I want to tell you, it's hard to get this many people through a line for communion, so this is why we're doing it. I'm going to invite you to stand. We're going to be reading from the book of Matthew. I want you to hear God's word tonight. We're going to be talking tonight, as we read the scriptures, we're going to be talking about a light in the darkness. Does anybody here feel like you're in the dark sometimes? Has anybody here felt this year like you've been in the dark? Anybody need a little bit of encouragement? Anybody need a little bit of hope? Amen? That's what we're going to talk about tonight. So I want you to hear these words from the book of Matthew, chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. It says, After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of King Herod, his magi from the east came to Jerusalem, and they asked, where is the one who has been born king of the Jews? It says, we saw his star when it rose, and we've come to worship him. When King Herod heard he was disturbed, and all of Jerusalem with him, when he called together all the people's chief priests and teachers of the law, he asked them where the Messiah was to be born. In Bethlehem and Judea, they replied, for this is what the prophet has written. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For out of you will come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod called the Magi secretly and found out from them the exact time the star had appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search carefully for the child, and as soon as you find him, report to me, so that I too may go and worship him. After they had heard the king, they went on their way, and the star, the star... They had seen when it rose, went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, listen, when they saw the star, they were overjoyed. Somebody say overjoyed. Overjoyed. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down, and they worshipped him. And then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold and frankincense and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Lord Jesus, we ask you to bless the teaching of the word tonight and just pray that my words are not heard, but only yours. In the name of our risen Savior, we pray. Amen. You guys can be seated. So I'm I'm curious, just by a show of hands, um, how many of you in here have a nativity scene set up at your house right now? Have a nativity scene set up, right? Almost every single house here has a nativity scene set up. And I I will tell you that when I was growing up, this is actually my favorite part of Christmas. Um, And the reason I liked it is because I would go to the attic, I would get the box, and I would bring it down, and, you know, we'd wrap all the little people and the animals in newspaper. And so as a kid, I would get to pull them out. So I would pull out, like, 
Mary, and then I pull out Joseph. And then, you know, y'all remember how the baby Jesus was always like teeny tiny, and he'd always be kind of like, you remember that? Like kind of he was like really, he was stiff and his arms were out, and you'd pull him out because he's supposed to be, you know, like a baby crying. And so, so you'd unwrap him, and you take it, and you unwrap the paper and the little manger, and you put him in it. And then you had the sheep, and then you had maybe a donkey and maybe a cow. You know, you could play with those. And then, and then you had to get out like the grass hut. You know, like, because, like, the, you know, you talk about, I mean, it, like, had, like, literally, like, grass on the roof, and you'd pull it out, and parts of it would fall off. Am I the only one that experiences a child, you know? Um, and then you get the little angel, and you take the little angel, and you hang the little angel uh, on the front um, of the nativity scene right there on the little barn. Uh, but I do remember when I would pull it out, there were always these three, these three guys that, that I would pull out, and they'd all be, be carrying gifts, and a lot of times they'd have their head kind of tilted. I mean, it's like all three of them are looking down. I don't know if they're looking at the baby or at the gift, but there were three guys, and we all know them as what? The three wise men, right? Or the three magi, right? And supposedly they were astrologers. We don't really know. Um, but I will tell you, for many, many years, probably almost um, as many years as I've been alive until I studied for this sermon, um, I just always assumed that because they were in the nativity scene, that they were there on the scene uh, the night, or at least the day of, uh, j- or the day after Jesus' birth. I mean, anybody in here think that? Am I, am I the only one? That the, the way that it's always been set up is that those three guys were there on the scene. Well, I want to tell you something. I'm totally going to burst your Christmas bubble. Because if you want to be historically accurate next year, you can actually take those three guys and you can put them... I don't know, out in your yard somewhere, or maybe at your neighbor's house. Because it looks like historically all things point to the fact that those three guys were not actually there on the night or the day after or the week after or possibly even the year after the birth of Jesus. Now, now how many of you in here when I say that just completely shocks you? Probably about 90% of you just don't want to raise your hand. It looks silly, right? So it's all good. Um... And the thing about these three guys that I want to talk to you about tonight is that you have to understand the whole purpose of the three guys being the story is not about their arrival to the baby Jesus. It's not about their arrival. It's actually about their journey to the baby Jesus. So we miss the point if we focus on the arrival. They just show up and they're there. The the focus of the story is in the journey. Um, It's kind of like us. A lot of times we're so hungry and we're so anxious to get there that we miss what God is doing in the process of the journey. Has anybody here been in a journey lately? Has anybody been in a series of ups and downs? And maybe you're in here and you're single and you're just going, man, I just am on this journey of singleness and it's awful and I just want to get married and I don't know if it's ever going to happen. I can't wait till I arrive. Maybe you're in here and you're married and you're on this journey of marriage and you just want to be single and you just can't wait till that arrives. (laughs) Maybe you're here and you're unemployed. And, and, and you're just going, man, I just want a job. I want a job so bad, and I'm praying, and I'm seeking, and I just can't wait till I get there because then I'm going to be happy. Maybe you have a job, and you're just going, I just hope I lose this job because I hate my job, and I can start over. And so we're on this journey. But so often we get so frustrated in the midst of the journey, we don't pay attention to what God's doing in it, that we're just so focused on, I want to get there, I want to get there, and I want to be happy. I think what God was doing when he put this story in the Scriptures that he was telling us we're on a journey we're on a journey um, that may possibly be difficult I mean some of us in this room have, have had a pretty good year I'd say I've had a pretty good year but I know that a lot of people in this room have had a pretty dark year in fact I can guarantee you they have because I know several families in our church that have had one of the darkest years of their life and it's dark what I want to say to you is that, man, I want you to pay attention to what God is doing in the journey. You may ask yourself, you may say, well, how, why, why weren't, why weren't the, the three wise men there on the, on the night of Jesus' birth? Well, I'll give you a few reasons real quick. Number one, the Bible says that after Jesus was born, they came from the east. So after Jesus was born, they came from the east. Number two, we know that they actually stopped by Jerusalem before they came. The text just said that, and they saw King Herod. And think about it, they're, they're traveling by camel. <clears throat> and then number three in verse 11, it says actually that when they came to the house 
where the child was with his mother. So the house where the child was. In other words, baby Jesus may have gotten a little bit older. They were in a home. And here's the fourth reason. Um, and I want you to think about this one. God gave them a star. He gave them a star. Now, I don't know about you, but I, I hadn't had a star in my journey. God didn't give me something to follow in the air, um, but he gave it to them. Now, why did he give them a star? Everybody in here knows the star, right? We all put it on top of the Christmas tree, if nothing else, right? My girls just panicked this year. We couldn't find the star in our little tiny tree, but anyway. Um, but we all put it on top of the tree, and why do we do that? We put it on there because of this story of the three wise men. We don't even know if there are three, um, but the wise men who were following and journeying towards the star. Um, Isaiah chapter 9, verse 2 says this, and I want you to hear this. It's a, it's a prophecy. It says, the people who walk in darkness, now listen, the people who walk in darkness will see a great light. For those who live in a land of deep darkness, a light will shine. This is prophetic. This is from the Old Testament. This is Isaiah saying this. He says, the people who walk in darkness will see a great light. For those who live in a land of deep darkness, a light will shine. God will give us hope as believers. I want to tell you this. If you have had a hard year, if you've had a dark year, if you've had a year of just down and depression, and you've had anxiety, and you just feel beat down, I want to tell you something. God will give us a light. His name is Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ is not just someone who exists in heaven at the right hand of the Father. Jesus Christ lives in the person to your left and your right if they, you are a believer, and they are a believer. Jesus Christ lives within us. And the greatest thing that I have seen in this church this year is that God has given us a light, and the light is called each other. I mean, has anybody in this room in our church been encouraged by another person in this church this year? I mean, we couldn't have gone through the things we have in 2019 without having each other. You see, so often we talk about this, this Jesus who came and he died and then he went to heaven. And we're like, I can't wait to be with Jesus again. And, and we talk about Jesus as though he's just this entity. But Jesus Christ, we are the body. We are the body of believers. I mean, do you know how heavy this year has been in this church? And what I want to say to you tonight, if you're here, I want you to know that Jesus Christ lives and reigns in all those who call upon his name and who believe in him. And the Bible is very clear that we are the light of Christ. And the most powerful thing that I've seen in this church is the way that we have encouraged one another and lifted each other up. And while I have the opportunity to say to you, if you're not part of a body, I want you to know that that is the way that you find light in the darkness. Because when my light goes out, I look to you for your light. And when your light goes out, you look to me for my light. It's like my, ni my nine-year-old birthday party. I, I, I got to tell you all this. Listen, my birthday is like in, in, in four days, like, like it's December the 28th. And I hated having a December the 28th birthday because Christmas, I mean, Jesus always won. He won every time. And I always got, like, the same gift. They're like, you know, here's your gift. It's also for your birthday, right? They always did that, right? It drove me crazy. And so what my parents decided to do, they were going to throw a party for me, and they were going to throw a party in July. So I was like, well, that's cool. And then all my friends were like, it's not your birthday. Why are you having a party? So anyway, we did it. Um, and it was the first birthday party that I ever had. And I remember I got the cake. And the cake was sitting in front of me, and they're like, nine candles. They're like, go ahead and blow it out. So I started huffing, I started puffing, and I blew the candles out, right? And this was like the first time that I'd ever seen this. The candles lit back up. <laughs> they lit back up, right? I mean, I know this is old school for a lot of people, but like for me, that was the first time I had seen that. And it was those trick candles. And I kept, I kept blowing, and they kept coming back. And when I think about that story, I think about us as the people of God. And I want you to hear tonight, while I have you here, while we're here as a family, while everybody's together, that the light of Jesus Christ cannot be put out. It cannot and will not be put out. It can't be put out in this church. And no matter how dark it gets, no matter how dark it gets in your life, because I know some people in this room probably feel like that this year God took them and put them in a dark room with no windows and slammed the door. But I want to tell you something. God didn't do that. Life did that. You see, life is broken, and God is good. See, life is broken, and God is good. And God doesn't cause things to happen. God allows things to happen. Sometimes we can ask why. 
But at the end of the day, we have to remember that the light will always shine in the darkness. See, we, we talked just a couple of days ago about John 1, 5, and it says, The light stands in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. The darkness has not overcome it. You see, I think this was prophetic when God gave them a star. I mean, it's just filled with prophecy that you've got these guys who are journeying from a foreign land, and they're probably not God-seekers. I mean, they're from a foreign land. We, we can assume probably that they're not Jewish. And yet, they're following a star. And when do the stars come out? Guys, this isn't a trick question. <laughs> stars come out at night. It's the title of the sermon. I thought it was pretty catchy. So I got with y'all. The stars come out at night. You see, the stars shine brightest at night. What I want you to hear is that your faith in Jesus Christ shines the brightest when you're the most broken. You know, a lot of times we think that when we're Christians, we're supposed to have this easy life where it's like, man, I'm, you know, I'm following him. Why are things going wrong? Stuff's going to go wrong to Christians just like everybody else. The difference is that we, we have the light of Jesus Christ and we have each other. The Bible tells us, it says that when, when they showed up, when they finally got to the baby Jesus, and you said it with me earlier, it's in verse 10, it says, when they saw the star after they had journeyed, probably a long way through their ups and downs, it says that they were overjoyed. Man, does anybody need some joy tonight? Anybody need some joy? Christmas time can be depressing, can it? You know, I, it, it's like probably the most stressful week of my year. I don't know about you, we've kind of lost it when it comes to Christmas. One of the last things we tend to have on Christmas is joy. Christmas Day, maybe, but the few weeks leading up to Christmas are not very joyful. Putting together toys, out searching for gifts for everybody and their brother, going to 5,000 Sunday school parties. Did I just say that? I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm just joking. I just went to one this year. I won't tell you which. Um, but we're doing all this stuff, and we forget that it's really about Jesus. And, you know, the only way that we receive joy is not, is not by seeking after all these other things. The only way we receive joy is by standing in the presence of God. And so that's what we're doing tonight. We're in the presence of him. And I'll remind you once again, being in the presence of him is being in the presence of each other. So I'll tell you one last part of the story. Um, when they arrived there, do you remember what they brought? Right. They brought three gifts. And that's why we always say there was three of them. But um, they brought three gifts. And they set them down um, at, at the feet of Jesus. They opened their treasures and they presented him with gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And I don't have the time to, to do another sermon on what those mean, but I will tell you this they represent his divinity, they represent his sacrifice. And they represent his suffering and his affliction. So his divinity, his sacrifice, and then his suffering or affliction. And they set these down at the feet of the baby Jesus and they worship him. We come tonight to sit at the feet of Jesus. Remember where you are. Remember whose feet we're sitting at. So I just want to remind you tonight before, b before we go, I just want to remind you of the little story that on that dark, starry night in the town of Bethlehem, and in a stable, this young virgin would give birth, and she would give birth to a child named Jesus, and she would place him in a manger amongst the donkey, amongst the cows, and the sheep would he lay. And this little baby laying in a manger would be the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. The King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. That's the way God chose to send the Savior into the world in the most humble way possible. This little boy would grow up, he would suffer on a cross, and he would die for us. And on the third day, he would be resurrected so that we could have light in the midst of the darkness. If you're here tonight and you're in a dark place, listen, I just want to lift you up, and I want to tell you that we love you and that God loves you. 
you're seeking after him, um, man, you're struggling. We are here for you. We're on your right and we're on your left. You're here and you, you don't have anybody. I want to tell you that the church exists for one another. We are the light of Jesus. So tonight, if you just want to be prayed over, man, hey, I don't know. I guess it's, it's kind of crazy in here, but you can turn to somebody and say, hey, anybody want to pray for me? Um, if you want to come up and kneel at these rails, we've got room for about eight of you. Um, <laughs> but we'll make it happen. Uh, because what I want you to hear is that Jesus Christ loves you, and you're not alone, you're not in the dark. I want you to lift up that little cup that you got, and I'm going to invite our band up here. Y'all can go ahead and break off your, your wrapper. I hear you doing it. Yeah, I knew it'd be a little awkward. As you find it, I want to remind you of who this little boy would grow up to be once again. He would grow up to be your Savior, the Savior of the universe. Jesus Christ, on the night before he gave himself up for us, the Bible tells us that he took bread and says that he broke the bread and that he gave thanks. And he said, take and eat. This is my body given for you. I invite you to receive. Go ahead and peel off your other wrapper. On that same night, Jesus took the cup. He said, this is the blood of the new covenant. This is poured out for you and me for the forgiveness of sins. As often as you receive this, remember me. I invite you to receive. Father God, I thank you right now in the name of Jesus, Lord, that you have given us hope in the Christ child. Um, Father, we do confess our sins before you. We confess that we are sinners, that we are broken, that we are in need of your grace, Lord. But Father, we thank you for the light that you gave us. Father, we thank you for the light of Jesus Christ. Lord, I just pray tonight if somebody came in and they are in a dark, dark place and they are struggling and anxious on this Christmas Eve, Lord, or they are broken, I just ask right now in the name of Jesus Christ and through the power of the Holy Spirit, you put a peace over this place. I ask for a peace that transcends understanding. Lord, I just want to pray that if somebody came in that had a rough year, 2019, that they are broken, that they are hurting, that they hear this message, you are the light and you have made a way. Jesus, I thank you for our beautiful family here. I pray for the families, especially this year, that have been through hardship and hurt and pain and brokenness and loss. And I pray, Father, that they know that they are loved and that they are embraced by the family of Buncombe Street. Father, I just thank you for this night that you have given us to remember the birth of your son. I pray that as we go home tonight, Father, we sit at um, the table with one another and we share life together and we celebrate, Lord, that you are God and that you are good. Father, thank you for our families. Thank you for our children. Thank you for the health that we have. Uh, thank you for the marriages that we have, the homes and the jobs that we have. God, we are grateful. And we just stop for a minute to give you praise for the King of kings and the Lord of lords and making all this possible we could sit at the feet of Jesus. Thank you that Jesus is our mediator. Thank you that he is our rock and our redeemer. God, you are awesome, and we love you so much. Thank you for being a light in the darkness for us, Jesus. We love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen.